This is Damian Macy, representing the Friends of the Marshall Public Library for our oral history project. Today is Wednesday, December the 20th of 2017, and I'm very pleased to have with us today in the library, Linda Miller. Her maiden name was Mitchell, and yes, she was related to Dr. Mitchell, and I'm sure she'll have some interesting things to tell us about that. With that, Linda, you're Thank on. You. Thank you. Well, uh, I was Dr. George Mitchell's, or I am Dr. George Mitchell's daughter. Uh, I, have a, I had a younger sister, five years younger, Mary Kay, and she died in 2004 from ovarian cancer. So uh, I'm, the, I'm the only one left in my family, which is kind of a lonely thing to be, <laughs> I've decided. Uh, but when I was born in California, because my dad was in, in the... Uh, Army Air Force down there for uh, this in the Second World War and he had lots of and my mother had lots of great experiences living that close to the Hollywood people who adopted the hospital that he was the executive officer for so but I don't really remember a whole lot about it because I left when I was two. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason not to remember. Yeah, I remember one thing, and that was we lived on Balboa Island, which was a little island off of, um, well, close to Santa Ana where he worked. Okay. But it was, it was full of beautiful homes, or kind of like vacation homes. But all the people who had them were so afraid that it was they were going to be. Uh, overtaken by the Japanese when they invaded that they all left. So they were good places for people that didn't have much money to live because they were written up for really inexpensive. I wonder if that area has had any devastation with the fires that are going on out there I, now. I don't think so because it's too... It's, it's far away? It's far away, yeah. But anyhow, that they, they, we lived there and uh, I was born in Orange, California. That's what my birth certificate says. And but. Anyhow, the thing I remember is that we, you, to get to the island, you had to take a ferry yeah. boat. And I don't re remember a whole lot about the ferry, but I remember the beautiful bay and the white uh, sails on the sailboats that were out in the bay. That's my, that's my California memory. Do you know, are they still running the ferry out to the island They're today? They're still running the ferry now, but uh, they, they, some, but they, they've actually built a bridge. Bridge? Yeah, but I haven't. I haven't been there, but uh, there's there's a lot about Balboa in that era in one of mm -hmm. his his second book more than his first book. Well, no, really both of them. But anyhow, they loved it out there. They had a good. If you can have a good time in a war, they had a good time in a war. My mother was a, 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 a airplane spotter, and she would she would go to the. When they had a, a, a not a raid, but a, a warning, she would go to this foxhole, and Yasha Heifetz was her buddy, was her was her partner, you know, the violin player. Mm -hmm. And they would sit in the foxhole together. My dad would go to the hospital, and I would, the neighbor would come get me in a little box that mother had fixed with all the stuff I needed to survive. And then they had this plan that if this was it, they'd go to the mountains and they'd go over the first mountain range of mountains. And then if they couldn't meet at that area, they'd go to the second range of mountains. And they had it, they were all planned out. Planned but out. I never had to use my survival thing. So anyhow, then I came to Marshall. Did your, uh, did your, your dad was in the military then, was it? The what? Army Air Corps. Army? Okay, I wasn't sure. I thought it was Army. It was Army Air Corps, but so he was in the, I mean, you know, he, he, if he hadn't, if things, if they, there hadn't been Pearl Harbor, he was the next one up to go get his air surgeon wings, and that's what he, that's what he was going to do, was work in the air. Did he ever convey on to you any of his, maybe not gruesome, but anyway, actual military experiences? Well, he never got any further to the military. Okay. He, he told me all about his military expenses, experiences, okay. but they were all, he never got off of the, you know, he never okay. left the United States. So. It seems like so many people kind of shy away and will not discuss their military right. experiences at all. Well, he, 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 I mean, he wrote a lot about it in his books, but 
is he was, he and my mom were living with another couple in Albuquerque, and because that's where they sent him first, and um, the the other doctor that they were living with is the one that was the first physician killed in in the war, because he his plane they were take he was supposed to be going to, I think the Philippines. And they flew right, right into Hawaii, right into, yes. in, right actually, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the battle. So that was, and I, I could tell you lots of stories about that because I've heard these stories for. Linda, you mentioned your dad's name, which was George Mitchell, but you didn't mention your mother's name. I happen to know what it is, but you might tell. My, my mother's name was Mildred, mm -hmm. which is what she was until she met Daddy, and then he, she became Millie. Millie. And she said, I could always tell where I met people because if they called me Millie, it was in Marshall. And if they called me any, any Mildred, it was before Marshall. <laughs> I, like, I personally like Millie better. But That's what I, I always knew her as. But... I called her mama. <laughs> so, of course. Yeah. <laughs> was her background nursing? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. They met at uh, Methodist Hospital. He was an intern and she was a... Uh, superintendent of uh, surgery. So. Okay. So you came. Were you still two when you came to Marshall? No, I was. I well, I was about three and a half, probably three, almost three. Still a youngster. Yeah, I was. Because I don't. We lived with Grandma Mitchell for a while. I'm told, and I don't really remember that either. She had an apartment and upstairs in her house, and there wasn't anybody there. And so then we lived up on Eighth Street and. I remember 8th Street very well, but I don't remember much about living at Grandma's. <laughs> I remember being, I mean, I, I practically grew up in that house. And what was Grandma's name? Her name was Alma Elizabeth. Alma Elizabeth, mm -hmm. okay. Was uh, the house on North and North 8th Street, and I knew that one quite well. You lived there until your folks yeah. built the new right. house, didn't yeah. they? Okay, because Edwards, I think, bought that house yeah, from your did. folks. Okay, because Brian is married to our daughter. Yeah. So, I've uh, been in that house a few times, too. Well, and, and the interesting thing is that I was, well, at some, after, I, I think there, I don't know if the Edwards has sold it to Marianne Moore's daughter or there was somebody in the middle. I can't remember. I think there was somebody in between. But anyhow, I hadn't been in that house, and when they, when Marianne's daughter bought it, she said, "You need to come look at this before they start remodeling it." And I walked in that house. I came home and I told Daddy, I said, "I could have gone to bed. Right? My bed was still there. It was a built-in bed. It, it was the same, painted the same color, and I mean, really? nothing had changed in that house." They For some reason, I think Edwards purchased that from your folks, they, but I'm not real sure. Well, either. they, they, they purchased it, I think, from my folks, but I don't know if there was somebody between Edwards and Mary Ann's daughter. I don't know. I think, yes, there was. Well, I, I, I know who it is, but I can't think of the Lydia, name right now. They, but she... Yeah, that's right. Uh, but but uh, the, the thing that got me was they still had the original dishwasher, and I think that was one of the very first... <laughs> dishwashers that ever appeared in, in, in Marshall, Illinois, because <laughs> it, it was a big, deep thing, and you had to, it had to be pulled out. It didn't flop down, and then you pulled those racks out. The whole thing came out, so. <laughs> Your memory of that house, how about the neighborhood? Oh, it was a, it was a, it was a nice neighborhood. It didn't have any kids in it, though. That was a pro, it was, that, I didn't think it was a problem, but as I got older and found out I didn't, I didn't know how to play with children, <laughs> I realized I should have had some children around. But because uh, I, I would spend, I would get up in the morning and I would go over to Virginia and Lou Dolls that lived next door, and they would. I, I'd walk in and there was a cereal called Pep that the Lou ate for breakfast. And I'd walk in, and he'd start going, Linda's full of pep, Linda's full of pep, because he was going <laughs> to, he made sure I had my pep when I got there, so I, I ate breakfast with him. And then Virginia would 
play all these games with me, and she she was a, had a they had a big grand piano and the and she'd play that and sing and talk, teach me all these songs. And we'd go into the organ and she'd play that, teach me some more songs. <laughs> and I, mean, I did it every single morning. I mean, just I just got up and went over to there. Like almost like a relative living next yeah. door. It becomes part of the family, really. And she'd let me, she had a big pantry and she'd let me take all the dishes, all the pots and pans <laughs> out and put them all back. I mean, and she got those. They went to Florida and came back yeah. with the parakeets, and she was raising parakeets upstairs in the ballroom, and and <laughs> so I learned how to breed parakeets at a very young age. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, it was. And then I would go over across the street, where Mrs. Baker had a, a home for elderly ladies. You know, the kind of mm -hmm. kind of like a probably like what assisted living is now. Was that Baylor B A Y L O R Baker? Her name was Edna Baker. Bayer. Baker. Like Baker. Okay. Okay. Like, like okay. That. Yeah. Remember and that. I would go over there, and we would play dominoes and whist and all kinds of things over there. We play games, and then I go down to Mrs. Baird's house, which is where the Steps live now, Marianne okay. and Terry. <clears throat> And she'd give me tea. She had these all these beautiful teacups, and every time I go, I get. I mean, I did this every day. This is my little routine. And then I would, if if Cole or Mama Cole were out on the porch, then I got to go over there, and and they had they had a basket under the stairway that had all these old 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 toys in them, in it, and we that was ever Keith played with those because he would come over some of it. What was they, Mrs. Cole's first name? I can't think of it for some reason. Well, Cole was Mary. Mary, yeah. Okay. And I don't know what her mother's name was. Um, she was Mama Cole, and yeah. we never called we never called her Mary. We yeah. called her, her name was Cole. Yeah. It was Mama and Cole, and uh, so I played with those, and then I'd come home, <laughs> and then I'd take my little red wagon down to Pierce's Grocery and buy the groceries my mother told me to buy. <laughs> so it was a very adult childhood, I think. You know, in retrospect. So, but that's so that's the house on Eighth Street. Mother planted flowers, and the good people of Marshall brought us produce, which I liked a whole lot more than the flowers. <laughs> now, I bet you went to the North Side School then. Too, I went to you? the North Side School. Yes. What do you remember about that school? Well, architecturally, it was beautiful. I mean, it was. I remember the huge, huge windows that were just glorious. I mean, all that natural light. And um, I remember that, you know, we all were scared to death we were gonna get killed by the atom bomb. And so we spent a lot of time ducking our hands over our head and going under the table or the desks. And I was thinking, this is the stupidest thing we've ever done. You know, I mean, even in the first grade, I knew this was a, not not going to save me from the atom bomb if it came. I, I figured that one out. So. Do you remember your teachers that you had there? Oh yeah, I had I had Mrs. Smith first, and she was. I I didn't start school. I didn't go to kindergarten. I I really literally the day I walked in there, I was four years old, because <laughs> they they didn't know what to do with me. I think, but I took a test to see if I could go to uh, kindergarten a year early, because my birthday's in December and the cutoff uh -huh. date was September. And I passed it so well that Charlie Bush decided that I probably was good enough to, I knew enough to go to first grade. So instead of doing kindergarten a year early, I did first grade two years early. And so that was, that was my, <laughs> and Mrs. Smith knew, knew that I hadn't, I, cause I didn't, I really didn't know how to play with children cause I had done what I just told you. And so I, uh, she, she protected me till I figured it out. She indoctrinated you then. Yeah, she, she <laughs> well she kept the kids from, you know, making, bullying me and all that kind of stuff. I went to the old Northside school too for first four years. And I remember it quite quite well, yeah. but the uh, you didn't have drink refrigerated drinking fountains, you didn't have a gym, you didn't have a uh, 
hot at food service. No. So I assume you probably were close enough that you no, walked home no, for lunch. Home, yeah. I used to, I used to, when they rang the bell for school to start, I'd leave my house and I'd get there and I never was late. <laughs> and then I went home and did the same thing for lunch. And, uh, but you know, we had all that stuff like, you couldn't go down in the bathroom because there were feet on somebody walk, there's somebody down there that walks on the ceiling. The girl's restroom was, was, that they scared, you know, they scared, the older kids scared the little kids all to death. And I, I mean, <laughs> some of the brave ones had to go and went, but I, I could do fine because I could go home at noon. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, but uh, the other thing that I remember and thinking about was they had the music room in the basement. Were you there for the music room? It was on the, in the attic. Well, was. Ours was in the basement, and it was this little stone, you know, like all of those things built in the 1800s. Was, your house probably has a, well, a stairway made out of stone that goes mm -hmm. down the basement. It was about this wide. And first of all, it was amazing that there wasn't anybody so obese that they couldn't get down there. But I... I really didn't. I loved music, and Libby Wells was our teacher, and I love Libby, but I really didn't like being down there because I thought if this place catches on fire, we're we're toast, literally. <laughs> and that's probably why the school went. But it was a fascinating school. Yeah, it was. When I went, <clears throat> it was a big third, huge room on the third floor with a skylight, and Von Arney would come play the piano for, for music. But I'm sure that was probably soon ruled off limits because it was a little tiny narrow stairway that went up to that yeah. third floor. Well, for a, we must, there must, I must have gotten there to the interim because we didn't go down in the basement till probably the fourth or fifth grade. But for a while we had, um, I can't remember her name, this lady, she played the cello, and she would she would bring the cello to the classroom, and oh. instead of having a piano accompaniment, she we'd do all this stuff, and she was she, that was good, and so we just stayed in our classroom. Did you go all eight years? Was the all eight no, classes no, in no. The school then? No, we went six years, and then we went That's to like, the okay. to the junior high, which was what was left of the building after it blew away with the tornado. Tornado. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was it was really a piece of work. <laughs> and then you went on into that thing called high school. Yes. Well, we had a little taste of high school because our class was a class that they were doing all the big remodeling, and they built the actual junior high that's out there now. We were the my class was the first class to get mm. in that, and I was in the eighth grade. I did seventh grade in the in the old building that got didn't that survived the tornado and then we were the eighth grade they were tearing out wherever the eighth grade I don't know where the eighth grade was before but they gave us the 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 wing of the high school that now is well it's the, it faces north but it was kind of like the end of the road then. Now it's, I think it's, it's got a big entrance and I think maybe it's even the front door of the high school, the front door of the high they school. Moved to the, yeah, to well, the we had side. that in. But they, they counted out however many rooms that we needed and they put, took masking tape and taped a line. This side was eighth graders, this side was, whoops, <laughs> high schoolers. and. We were never to cross that line. And you know, I don't think anybody ever did. I mean, I can remember people walking up to it and saying, oh, oh no, no, no. <laughs> and, but it, uh, anyhow, at the end of the school year, about probably the last quarter, we went to the, we got to move into the new junior high and we got to pick up our own desks and walk over there and put them down. Really? And then we picked up our own chairs and put, you know, we moved ourselves in, which that wouldn't fly today either. And that helps make a very firm memory though of well, about starting school. We loved it, school. we loved it, yeah. What was your uh, favorite subject in school? Well, I was a math science person, really. 
but I lo I loved school. I loved I I loved my teachers, and I just I still love school. I mean, I could go to school forever. So <laughs> I love to learn. So. That's so it's fortunate because so many children and young people do not like school I know. or don't like a teacher and it just seems to go downhill from there. And at home and school and all, did you have some chores or some things that uh, were required? To well, that were required? Not really. My mother was one of eight kids. My, my mother had a horrible childhood, really, a horrible childhood. And so she just, she just kind of doted on us. I mean. I mean, we did stuff, but she, we weren't out there cutting up the fruit for her to can. She did all, she wanted us to have all the stuff she did. that she did. And so I, I was responsible. <coughs> I mean, if, you, if she asked you to do something, you did it. And so I did, she had all those roses and she fertilized them with, with dead minnows <laughs> or little fish. And that was one of my jobs was to go around and dig up a hole by each each and plop a fish in it that wasn't that wasn't real high on my list I, <laughs> I can understand why. and and i did uh, she we shopped at bill pierce's and i could go down there without crossing the street and mm -hmm. i had a red wagon and she literally would send me with a list even before i even started school and i would go down there and pick out the stuff and she took me and taught me how you know how how to choose a vegetable a fresh mm. you know fresh vegetables and and what how she wanted her meat cut Bill knew but she made sure because I, I would stand back there you know he's up here somewhere and I'm down here and I'm saying well now you, she you got to cut a little of the fat off of that yet I mean that kind of stuff because that's what my mother told me I mean that's I had to take it home like mother wanted well, you remember it, and I do too, that there were so many small neighborhood grocery stores all over Marshall. Right. And most of them were within walking distance yeah. because I guess remember, I remember after the war, um, there were not a lot of cars. So people had to depend yeah. on walking to get there. Yeah. Well, we had two. We had Van Arsendale's, which mm -hmm. was on the other corner. Oh, and yeah. I had to cross the street with my wagon for that one. So we go down to Bill's. He taught me how to, how to thump of watermelon to hear that was right and he mother loved colby cheese and he'd all he called that would be cheese it would be cheese if you let it age let it long enough <laughs> he'd say oh you don't want colby cheese you want that would be cheese linda <laughs> so but, so he was that was part of my when i was visiting the dolls and the beards and the and I remember at Van Arsdale's store, you could buy a candy bar for nickel at that yeah. time, even. It probably may have went up by the time you went. By seven cents. <laughs> Gone other days. Um, did you have any activities that you were involved in in high school? Oh, lots of them. Yeah. If, if there was a thing, I was there. <laughs> yeah. We, I did GAA, which was a real laugh because I'm, I, I have no athletic ability. But I did it. And and it was it was fun. Uh, PE was my least favorite subject because I really can't do. Miss Miss uh, <laughs> Griffin was a PE teacher, and she was nuts about volleyball. She said, "If you learn to play volleyball, you'll have a sport for life." Which she's she's right to a point, but I was terrible. And, but we played it probably two or three days a week because you have PE every day. Mm -hmm. And she would, the last, probably the last half of the last, probably the last three or four weeks of my senior year, I finally hit a volleyball over the net because I never had. And the entire class you know, cheered. Cheered. It was, it was like the only standing ovation I've ever had. But yeah, I was just terrible. But yeah, I was in GAA and I was in FBLA and I was in the Bi Fi Kim Club and I was in the Latin Club and the National Honor Society and the Student Council and, you know, on and on. You had mentioned someone, I believe, uh, Mrs. Dahl playing piano for you. Were you involved in music at all? I took music lessons. That was one of the things my mother thought we all needed. Mary Kay had all the, she had all the musical ability, but 
I did play, and I, excuse me. Sure. When I come, when I get inside, and it, it, I think I, I finally decided I think it's the carpet they put on, on, on commercial buildings. But I just, yeah, yeah. I just start gripping. So, anyhow, uh, I took piano lessons from Mrs. Tarman. I did who, too. Did you ever do them when you, she was at Mame Smitley's? No, because we had moved to Martinsville okay. at my fourth grade year, and I started taking lessons, and she had a studio in her home. Yeah, well, I, I went there first. But okay. then Mame Smitley, I think, must have rented out the room or something. I think so. And or at so least you, you'd go, make it available. Yeah, so you'd go there, and I, I think maybe she traded it for some piano lessons for her kids or something. Could be. And... Um, so I'd go down there, and that made my mother very happy. Because my mother didn't, when she came to Marshall, she did not drive. And Grandma Mitchell taught her to drive, because be, she was doing Girl Scout stuff, you know. Oh. And she had to haul all those kids around places, and she had to learn how to. So Grandma taught her. Grandma was a terrible driver, so Mother was a much better. Mother was a good driver. Grandma <laughs> was, she, Mother uh, was an improvement over her teacher. But in that in that department, but uh, yeah, I took piano lessons and I actually played a solo at my eighth grade graduation. Ooh. And I really I'm not a performer, and I really wasn't then. And I had this blue taffeta dress with white uh, something over it, kind of a see-through white thing and and I'm playing the piano and my veins are standing up and I look at my hands and I look at my dress and my hands master my dress and I said if I dear God if I get through this I, I will never again play in public <laughs> piano in public again and he got me through and I didn't <laughs> you both kept your promises we both kept our promises <laughs> So were you involved in like chorus or anything in oh, music yeah. well, at, I was uh, in, in high school? And I play, yeah, and I was in the percussions. Okay. The, the, band. the, the well, the the criteria for being in the percussion was that you had braces on your teeth because you couldn't wear. So uh, the whole percussion we all had. <laughs> you know. But that we I enjoyed that. I like band. I like chorus too. I wasn't a very good singer, and actually when I was way up in high school, and Von Arney was our mm -hmm. choral director at the church. In front of the whole choir one day, he looked at me and he says, you know, Linda, you just stand back there and puff, you can't sing. Just just, just quit singing and just say the words. <laughs> so I was just mouth them. <laughs> so, oh, dear. That's, that was Mr. Arney, right to the point. <laughs> he had it. <laughs> yeah, I knew him. His wife was a good friend yeah. of my mother, too. The uh, year that you graduated then from high school, this what year? 61. 61, okay. Can you kind of reminisce about what Marshall might have looked like in 1961? Oh, well, I, I really don't think, I, well, there was a candy kitchen that really was a candy kitchen, which I was not allowed to go to. <laughs> so I'm the one, I'm one kid that really doesn't know a whole lot about the candy kitchen because my mother thought it was a den of inequity. So, I think more than one mother probably yeah. thought that too. But. And I know there were two taverns because, the, you know, the Diamond and the Frontier, because my mother said we were never to go in there. And one time, right <laughs> well after Mother died and before Mary Kay died, we were down here walking, and we had we were walking down, and all of a sudden we did this and did this and did this, and then we both started laughing because we were walking the way we always did when we walked down the street because we had to go out from the bars. Those old patterns don't fade, They do didn't they? fade, no, but we just laughed and laughed and laughed about how crazy that was to think, you know, so. The, see, the highway had gone around Marshall at that time, hadn't it? No, 70 wasn't in. No, but Route 40. Route 40, the new Route 40 Marshall. was the new Route 40 was out there. Yeah, right. It was there, and 
Daddy, the daddy was still in the office down here. He wasn't. He had the medical center wasn't. Done. Right. And Klopfelder's had a the Hudson dealership next oh, yeah. door to the office because that's what Daddy always bought. And there was, I think there was a where the bank that's not there anymore, but or the building is. But I think that was a. a I don't think it was in '61, but at some point it was a. Uh, a hatchery or a, they raised chickens in there. Well, there was a hatchery in that corner, yeah, yes. There was, but I don't know when it went away. I don't quite. I think, I think it was there up until almost the time that building was brought down to build the new bank. Yeah, because that's what was there. And then um, the parking lot thing, I think that was, There wasn't, there was always that parking lot, I think. I don't remember what was in that, next to the office. There was that, there was a hatchery and there was the, the Clapfolders dealership and the alley and Daddy's office. And then I don't remember what this was. And then the Clark, the, the Herald. Right, paper. the newspaper office. Yeah. Uh, the building that your dad had, I think he had an apartment upstairs. Yeah. Did. Your folks never did live there, did they? No, that was one of the pictures I brought was okay. as uh, Mary and Walter Foley. They okay. lived there when I was a kid. Okay. And I, I, I brought that. that picture because when we moved, when they moved us back to Marshall, or <laughs> when they moved back to Marshall and brought me along, me and the dog, um, Mary and Walter lived upstairs, and Mother was working as the nurse in the office. And so they got Mary, Aunt Mary became my babysitter. So I would go to work with mother and daddy and then I would go upstairs to Aunt Mary's and she would play, do you know, all this stuff. This was before we moved to, really before we moved to, or I'd been up and I think it was before we moved up to the house. And I think that, I think that's part, it started when we were down at grandma's. Anyhow, she would take me and we'd do all kinds of fun stuff at her. She taught me how to do needlework and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then, but her big thing was she loved Cokes. So we, middle of the morning, we'd come down the stairs and we'd go over to um, the drugstore. I've forgotten what it's called. Heifers? No, started with a B. Uh, ben, uh, Benson's. Benson's, we'd go to Benson's drugstore and we get a Coke. Do you ever then, have ice cream at Rademacher's down here? No, because I don't drink. I eat, don't drink. I don't eat ice cream because it makes me sick. <laughs> Too bad. So I've missed all the ice cream stuff. Um, you're, you're, if I'm not mistaken, your grandfather built was it. a doctor in the building. Right. Right. And that's, he that's was. Right. His, my grandfather put himself through medical school and then he put his brother through dental school and then they put the other brother, which was Earl, through the two of them through medical school. So they kind of created this little... Earl was my grandmother's doctor. And I think even doctor with him until he moved to Martinsville. Or your dad. Both of them, I guess. You see, there were a lot of doctors. Oh gosh, yes. And kind of a lot of them had the name Mitchell. Yeah. <laughs> with the... Uh, Growing up, and I want to come back to this, grade school, high school, what was it like being the daughter of the Doc local doctor? Well, you learn how to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you really, I mean, you know, you know, you knew things that you knew you shouldn't. And not, I mean, not, I mean, daddy, daddy talked about his work, but he never talked about the people. people. You know, he'd say, I, you know, I had this interesting case today, and then he'd tell it to Mother and Mary Kay and I sitting there, and, you know, you hear this enough. But a lot, a lot of what, I think what made our family life different was that we, we didn't have family time. We had to make family time. And family time was very, very important to both of my parents. And so we, we spent a lot of time in the car with daddy because when he would make house calls we'd go along and we'd sit you know I, I sat outside of many a farmhouse 
reading the funny papers or re reading something and and he'd be inside and then we'd get in the car and we'd go to the next place. When we first moved here, they did home deliveries. Uh -huh. So they'd get a home they'd get a call in the middle of the night, they'd go scoop me up out of bed. This was before my sister. They'd lay me in the back seat of the car, and the back seat of the car until the the, almost the day he died, had three things in it that were never taken away. One was his bag, which sat right, was right behind his seat. One was a bunch of cigar boxes, which was behind the other seat. And then he had this, this uh, splint. It was a hip splint, and it's this metal thing that's really long because it's made to fit any size, you know. And it's about this big around, it's got leather like padding around it, and then this, these two metal strips that come all the way down and then have a little like a place to put the arch of your foot. And it was, it was always there. So when we went together as a family, and we, we, it was a long time before we got a Ford or a car, we'd get in, and Mary Kay and I'd have to climb over the, ba the bag, climb over the splint, and climb through the... <laughs> so it was a real interesting place to spend your, your spare time, you know. But we go do all these, go around on all these rounds. And then, when, like I started to say, when they were, were doing deliveries, they'd take me out, mother would take a blanket and a pillow, because you know most of these babies were born at night. And they'd be in this house, and I'd be asleep at God knows where. It seems like we went to Bullskin a lot, but I've never quite figured out where Bullskin go is, <laughs> but wherever it is, I spent a lot of time there. and. Uh, but I would sleep out there. Mother would come out every once in a while and check on me. You wouldn't now, leave a kid in a car like that, in a place like that now for... <laughs> Someone would probably report you. Yeah. But <clears throat> now I think of car, and I know the heaters weren't the greatest thing, but there were some babies delivered, I'm sure, during winter, yeah, too. Well, I had more blankets. More blankets, more okay. Blankets, yeah. But I, I, I went to a lot of those deliveries. And then what I remember is getting home and Daddy holding, picking me up and carrying me to bed. That's the, that was the best part. <laughs> but, and then we always had, we always ate really late because he was always, you know, out a lot. So we would eat at, you know, eight or nine o'clock, which I'm sure most kids were in bed at eight or nine o'clock. But to this day, I eat it. I mean, I don't get hungry until about four in the afternoon. That's when I went home. Came, you know, three to four, I came home from school and I'd get something to eat. And then we'd eat again about, and about eight o'clock at night, I'm just ravenously hungry. So it, it, it really stuck, I guess. And you didn't have fast food services to go no. out and get them either, did you? Mother made everything. Mother was a really good cook, but she, I mean, she made her own bread. We had homemade bread all the time. And I can remember sitting in a chair with a whisk making, uh, Angel food cake. You know, you've got to, you, well, you have to get all this meringue yeah. made, and she didn't have one of those electric things. She just sat there and did it. <laughs> but uh, we had, she, had, all the kids, when there was a lot of stuff going on with, you know, <clears throat> diseases, he'd know which kids needed, we could, could go back to school, so he'd write them all out the night before, and then. The morning they came back, they'd come by the house and pick up the mother and hand them their, their admittance to go Permission. back to school. <laughs> so we always had a lot of those kinds of things. And we had, we had, um, the other thing was you couldn't talk on the telephone because you couldn't tie up the telephone. And it took me, I'd probably been married 10 or 15 years before I could say more than Hello, yes, okay, I'll talk to you later, bye. <laughs> I just, I just couldn't do it. And uh, on Sundays, we always went to do the hospital rounds. And those were real, they didn't allow, they didn't allow children right. in the hospital. So we didn't go in the hospital, we just went to the hospital. And we sat in the car, so in the winter it was cold, and in the summer it was hot. And we took, we came down to Mr. Benson's, and we got the paper, and we got, we went to church, and then we went and got the paper, and 
I don't know, I don't think we ate lunch, or if we did eat lunch, we must have just grabbed something real quick. And then Mr. Benson would always give Mary Kay some of those uh, cough drop things. She got the cherry flavor, I got the licorice flavor. And then we'd go to Terre Haute, and we'd, and we'd read the paper, and the highlight was after several years, there was a pharmacy or a drugstore on the corner right next to Union Hospital, and they, they opened on Sundays, every other Sunday. So every other Sunday, we could go to a warm building and drink a Coke. <laughs> So, and, and then we, but, you know, he, he, he could be in there for hours. Oh, yeah. And then he did, he did St. Anthony's and he'd do, we'd go up to Dana then and see my mother's Aunt Nellie, Uncle Ward, and then we'd come back by and go and talk with the Paris Hospital. So, I mean, it was, that was our Sunday. That would take most of the day, It took the it? whole day, yeah, it was a whole day event. But wow. we were together for all those miles in the car. This was a family, family car. So, your dad, I know, was <coughs> subject to emergency calls, and again, that telephone thing that you mentioned, um, if he was called out, say, for an accident or something on the highway, did you end up going with that on that run too? No, we didn't get we didn't go to those. Okay. But the closest thing to emergency we went to was a baby. Babies. But. We did, with the way that house was, since you've been in it, you know, it was like all one big room upstairs that we slept in. There were the two bunk beds. And then, but it was really an unfinished half attic when they moved there. And we all lived in kind of the bedroom at the end, closest to the bathroom. Well, then mother just figured out how to put in these built-in beds in the stair hall, really. And that became our case in my bedroom, and then they had a, a one of those, they're not a sliding door, but a, those kind folding of door? folding door, folding door, that plasticky stuff. Yeah. Yeah. She put one of those up there, but she really didn't want her kids, she wanted to be close to her kids, so she'd leave it open all the time. So when the, when the phone rang in the middle of the night, we'd hear every, every word of one side. So we, we, we caught a lot, well, we got really smart. Because, <laughs> well, because we, we knew what, you know, if he asked certain questions, it was an OB case. And if he asked other questions, it was a road accident. And, and so we, we kind of got the gist of what was going on. But, so we had, we had that, that kind of, you know, sparked up our nights sometimes. And, I know your dad was <coughs> quite instrumental in some of the safety features on Route 40. Um, and the markings and all, and the, uh, I mean, he must have run into some terrible situations. We did. With accidents on that. Yeah. He had, well, they wrote the I-70 thing, that's how they got it passed, was a document. He, they had a committee and they, the coroner and the cops, or the sheriff and the highway patrol and, and daddy, or some doctor, but they had a different, you know, group of, I knew he was quite, uh, yeah. quite in the focus for getting some of those improvements yeah. made. And I know at that time, I'm not sure when that changed, the, there was not an ambulance service in communities. No, that was, that was the, um, the... The undertakers the, yeah, went in the hearse. were the only ones that had an ambulance. Or, well, they weren't really ambulances, they were hearses. Yeah. And that was the way to get people to the hospital. Yeah. Now, was your dad involved in getting the... Ambulance services established too. He was, he was involved in all of that. I thought so. He was a real. He was what. A, a, in my opinion, I, and I kind of got it verified a month or so ago, but. People who doctors who practice in rural areas, first of all, see things that I mean. People don't see trucks rolled over in a creek, but. 10 feet of water in it and you're trying to tread water and get somebody out of the truck and I, you know, that kind of stuff. And so he, he, but he was very, in, he was, he thought his duty was not only to take care of people who were sick or injured, but his was to make the whole community a better, safer place. That was one way you prevented, 
you know, he, he, you, you prevented things that yeah. could be. Mm -hmm. the, first, the first thing I remember him really working on were the phones. The what? phones. Oh. Because they had, they had all of the, of the uh, area, everybody was on uh, party lines. And I was, I was little, I mean, little, I was, I think I was probably, well, I wasn't at Aunt Mary's, but I was, you know, I wasn't very big. And I walked in the back of the office one day and he's back there on a, he had a phone, a wall phone back in the back hall. And he is screaming bloody murder <laughs> and yelling. And I, I just kind of, and he finally hung, slammed it, hung up and pu pulled the phone out of the wall. And he had been talking to the president of General Telephone. And he had been telling him why they needed to be not on the party line because of all these people that wouldn't get off the line or somebody else died, that kind of, which literally was happening. And he didn't like to see that. And he was, but they fixed it pretty quickly after that. So. Well, and at that time, too, was probably still the old uh, telephone systems with the plugs. Oh, yeah. And the op phone oh, operators yeah. were directing the calls. Yeah, I, I talked to Clarksville quite a bit when I was older. Because we, but we usually had, we had um, phone sitters. They never left the house without somebody there. Now that was fine when we were little because that person doubled as a babysitter. Oh, but I can't but, it was, but it was real interesting when I got old enough to date and these guys had come home <laughs> or pick me up and there would be this nice, la nice lady there. <laughs> you know, I'd say, that's a phone sitter and they'd go, huh? <laughs> so I'd have to explain because they had to, they had to have somebody to do that. Well, I hadn't thought of this, but at that time, of course, there weren't cell phones and everything, but if the sitter got a call, how did they relay it on to your dad? Well, that was a problem. She would, she would talk to them and tell, take the message and tell them that, you know, she'd get in touch with him. And she, I think, had numbers maybe for where he was, but he wasn't always, he was often en route. Okay. And the thing that was a real saver was when CBs came out, mm -hmm. that he bought one, and he put a base in the house and one in the office. And that was a wonderful thing, because mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times he'd walk in the door and mother would say, well, now you can need to go see blah, blah, blah. And they lived right next door to him down in Bullskin or someplace, you know. And, and she'd told him, run, you know, run over to your neighbor here or there when he was already gone. And so there was all this before the CB. And after the CB, wherever he was, he could just That's, turn around and go I back. I really hadn't thought about it that much, yeah. but the communications the was communi a major it, problem. Yeah, it was a real problem. And it was a real, you know, it ate stuff up and of course she's you know my mom would be at home and and it, he'd be somewhere and he'd be gone a real long time and she was afraid he'd you know gone off a bridge in a Don't ditch know. or god knows what out there in the boonies at two in the morning and that kind of stuff and he could be out there and someone had a problem two doors down right. and he'd come all the way back and home and, then back to go back. and he did that a lot and so that's why wow and she went out and bought these <coughs> huge end tables it took her a long time to find them so she could put that whole thing in there by their bed without it looking like you know the police station or something but, <laughs> but uh, yeah that was that was a big step up I would think so yeah so when did he actually go out to the uh, medical center then or so he went they went out there and I want to say about 65, 66, uh, okay. 67. I think they went, they were either out there or in there sh shortly after I graduated from college, and that was 65. Well, I guess then we'll go from, you're graduating from high school, you went to college. Yes, I did. <laughs> Where did you go? I went to DePaul. DePaul? Yeah. Nice school. Yeah. And what was your major? Nursing. I started out as a poli-sci major. 
but I, and then I decided I what I really wanted to do was to be a research scientist, but I didn't really want to be have a PhD because I wanted to get married and have kids. <laughs> Did your mother and dad kind of help influence that the career? No. Nope. They were they were actually surprised because I actually I cannot stand vomit so. <laughs> <laughs> and they, just, I mean, my sister would get sick. I wouldn't go in that bathroom for days. So. But you knew a nurse would have to face that. Yeah, and that's what they said. But, <laughs> but it was, it's a good, it's a good occupation, really. What, uh, what year did you graduate from college? Sixty-five. Sixty-five. Okay. What. Uh, did you have as a, I guess, a target? Oh, when I graduate, I'm going to do. Did you have some plans or thoughts of what you might want to do? Yeah, I wanted to get married and have babies. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> yeah, well, I graduated on the 6th of June and got married on the 12th of June. So. You didn't waste any time then. No, I didn't. And uh, who's that young man that you married? Keith Miller. <laughs> Had uh, had he gone to Nepal also, or no? He went to Purdue. Okay, he was in engineering, which, think, which was very nice because Daddy went to Purdue, and everything revolved around Purdue. Yeah, that and was that was one of the fun things we did. Was we got to go to the Purdue football games once in a while. So you married the same year you got out of school, and where did you just settle? Well, the United States Air Force sent us to Opine, Montana, which is about that big. It's four miles south of the Canadian border. The year we were there, they paved the main street. It was a radar site. It was 60 miles one way to the nearest grocery store. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, we actually liked, and there, of course, you know, one of the reasons I went into nursing was you can always find a job, not in Opie, Montana. So Keith got there three months. He went up in March and came home to get married in June. And while I was up there, they decided on this, that they needed to have a kindergarten. So Keith talked him into making me the teacher. So when we got up there, now, granted, you know, I never went to kindergarten. And so I didn't know much about kindergarten. <laughs> and so they gave us a, told, told them, the women that put this together, that they could have this block, concrete block building for their, for the school. It had a, it had a bathroom and it had running water and, you know, heat. And so Keith and I went over and painted it and then they told, told me to buy materials. So they gave me this big catalog, catalog. So I ordered tables and I ordered little chairs and, and I ordered different things I thought would be good to have in a kindergarten. <laughs> and I taught kindergarten. What was the name of the town? O-P-H-E-I-M, Opine. Pine. <laughs> and uh, then the next year we were there they wanted me to teach second grade. And I said, well, I can't teach second grade because I'm not a teacher, I'm a nurse. And they said, well, then you can be in a, a teacher's aid. And I said, fine. So I, was, I taught second grade because the woman who taught second grade was, uh, was not much force. And How large was your class? It was, it, I, I think there were like about 25 kids. Oh, but really? The, but the thing that was, the town itself had a population of about 400. It had a Catholic church, a, a, a Baptist church, and a Lutheran church. It had a whole bunch of bars. Um, you had to check your gun when you went in. I never went in but one, but I did hear this. And they all had dirt floors. And then they had, they had a bowling alley, which had pinball machines. And, and a kind of a luncheonette kind of thing. That was the, they had, they had a uh, post office in the back of a 
kind of a general store. You could buy you could buy uh, potato chips there and stuff. I mean, you couldn't. So then we went. You know, every, every six weeks we went and bought groceries. That was our big. We go to we go to Glasgow, which <coughs> is where that where the Glasgow. There's a town of Glasgow, which was the big town, relatively speaking, and then there was Glasgow Air Force Base, which was a they were shooting, having B-52s taken, riding around up there with atom bombs on, you know, nuclear stuff. So the the commissary was at Glasgow Air Force Base. So we'd go to the Air Force. We'd go down. We'd check into a hotel in Glasgow. We'd watch television because we didn't get American television. We only got Canadian television. <laughs> and the only radio we got was had played beautiful music, but it was French Canadian, so we couldn't understand the news. And so we go down to Glasgow, and we we spend the night and watch TV. And they had this saloon that looked like it was right out of Gunsmoke. And then behind it was this wonderful steakhouse. You walk through the saloon, they open the doors. Here's all these linen tablecloths and all this wonderful food. And so we'd eat steak, and then we go out to the commissary and we'd buy six weeks worth of food and we'd go home. So Marshall you thought was a small town but when you got into Montana it was a much it much smaller town. Much right? smaller and there were there were 400 bit men on this base and 27 women where we lived in this because they built they built 27 houses and so we lived in a military built house hmm. and each one had a woman, you know, but, and you had to be, a, you know, the, the higher rank. Keith was second in command, so we got a nice house. And then there was a, the rest of them were men. And they, they, we got to see three movies a week up there because the government, it was, it had a name, some kind of, it wasn't remote, but something like that. So we got special stuff, like on, on Fridays, Keith was one of his extra duties was he was in charge of the, of the mess hall. And on Fridays was fish day and seafood day. And every Friday they had lobster. And every Friday Linda had lobster. It came in a napkin wrapped up out of Keith's pocket. <laughs> and, but they had, uh, they brought in three, three movies a week. They, they didn't, however, provide us with a screen. So they had a, they had a mail room that had little boxes, you know, like, mm -hmm. kind of like they, they have at the post office. So we put a screen, a sheet over those. They had one projector. So they'd play the first reel and then everybody would leave and go out in the hall and they'd rewind it and put in the second reel. And then they'd do the third reel that way. I had a big, you had to bring your own food. So I had a big purse that I had aluminum foil in and I popped corn and put it in the purse and then we go to the movies. And we saw all these first run, first run movies. <laughs> they were wonderful, but the problem was because of the way they were showing, that was back in the day as a cinemascope. And to this day, I don't know what happened on the other two sides. All we saw was the <laughs> saw the middle part. <laughs> saw the middle part. <laughs> well, it was at least, at least better than watching the, uh, the, the deer in the woods. Huh? Well, we, we had antelope. That we didn't have any woods. There was no, no, uh, this was on the plains, the real okay. plains. Okay, We had one of our neighbor's dads was a, a, a landscape guy, and he, he had, he sent, sent us one year for Christmas, every house got a tree. And we babied those trees and not many of them made, made much headway. But, but I did have antelopes that came up in my backyard every single day. I love them. Yeah, they're beautiful animals. But, so you were in Montana. Where did you venture to there? Chicago, From there. Chicago. Wonderful. Yeah. That's a big change <laughs> from Montana to Chicago. <laughs> yeah. So, and we were there about a year and a half, and then Keith got out, and then we went to Oklahoma because he went there to grad school, and we never left. 
except for a couple of years we went to. Were you in the city of Chicago around the suburb? We were in Arlington Heights. Okay, it's a nice, nice suburb. Yeah, it wasn't bad, but I preferred Old Pine actually. It was a lot more fun. So how long were you in the city of Chicago? About a year and a half. That was long enough then too. Yeah. So did you go directly to your town that you're living in now in yeah, Oklahoma? Norman. Because we went to the university, he went there to the university, and we we fell in love with living in a university town. And that's Norman. Yeah. So Keith was doing graduate work when you went there. Yeah. We're going to his PhD in nuclear or uh, theoretical physics. And what when did? Here did he finish that? He recall? finished that in 70, trying to think, 73. Okay, so from the time you moved from graduation all of it, it didn't take him very long to, to get to that level then. Now, did he do any teaching at all? He did a little, but he's mostly done stuff with, he's, he did his, they have a program out there called engineering physics, and he, that's what he did his work in, and that, has really, he's, he's, he can give a 40 year lecture on why you want engineering physics. It, when he was doing physics was at the time when, like we used to have a cartoon that we somebody sent us that we kept on the refrigerator. And they, it was somebody wanted to hire truck drivers, but he wasn't, the PhD physicist wasn't wasn't it didn't have the, enough education or something like that they, they just weren't hiring physics but they but so he had this engineering degree engineering physics degree and that got him jobs so he's been a research engineer he's been a radar engineer he's been a petroleum engineer he's been i don't know he can tell you he's been all kinds of engineers but he's got he's been able to do that first of all because he's smart but secondly, because he's he's has that engineering. But in Montana, he was in the military. He was right? in the military, and he was a radar maintenance officer. So when you went to Chicago, did he leave the military then? He he after we were there a year and a half, and then he left okay. the military and went to. Montana. I'll ask you: Did you ever go back to teaching? <laughs> well, <laughs> I I didn't do any. Well, when we were in in that little. Well when, we went, well, when we went to, after I got done teaching, I, when we got to Oklahoma or to uh, Chicago, I worked in a hospital. And I, it was fine. I mean, it was really, we, we rented this townhouse and I walked across the front, literally at the front yard of the hospital and went to work. And he walked to the, to the other side, across the street, and he was at the radar station. So that worked out nice. And then... Uh, when we got to Oklahoma, I was pregnant. Well, we moved, we moved there in June and Molly was born in September. So after, when she was, right after Christmas, when she was three or four months old, I got a part-time job with the health department. And I worked, I had this area of a, we live in Cleveland County, an adjoining county is um, McLean County. And I was a health nurse for McLean, okay. for the northern half of McLean County. So I had a clinic once a week. I had four schools I was a school nurse for, so I'd do two one week and two another week, because two of them were north of me and two of them were south of me. And then I had one day every other week that I did home visits on people. And I liked that job. We, that was a good job. And I You could, didn't have any? No. <laughs> None of that. So that <laughs> Not was even good. in school. Huh? Not even in school. I, I worked my way around. Well, then, <laughs> then he, when he got finished, he, he got a job as a research engineer in Dallas so, or Richardson. So we moved to Texas, and I worked there for part like I don't know. Well, when we moved there, I was pregnant again, and I, we were there about three months, and we, I had this baby. And then when he was six or eight months old. I started working every other weekend at this hospital in Chicago, and I was the medication nurse. That's back when they, and all I did was push a cart and pass out medications. 
But the place I worked in was that they put me in was in the VIP. Now this see this is very Texas. This was this is very Dallas. They had a VIP section and it was on the top floor of this Presbyterian hospital, which at the time well, still is, is a really high deal hospital in, Ta in Dallas. And <clears throat> they had a, a medical wing and a surgical wing. And I worked on the, sur in the uh, medical wing. And they literally had people from all over the world that came movie stars, sheiks from Araby, you know, I mean, literally all these people. And they had a, a chef and a full kitchen, so they got all their food cooked there, not down in the, where, where the rest of the people had to get their food cooked from. And um, every afternoon, this, this, chauffeur dressed kind of man with a big rack of bed bed clothes and bed jackets from Neiman Marcus would come and roll this up and down the aisles of them people would buy their clothes. There were two or three rooms on each one of these two sides that had a sitting room and an extra bedroom and you know it was like a little sweet thing. It was it was really I mean, I met, I, I saw sides of life I'd never seen before and I'll never see again, <laughs> but yeah. There were four beds, uh, bay, uh, wards there either, were there? No, no wards, no <laughs> wards, no. But anyway, I did that and then we moved back to Norman because we hated it down there. And this company Keith was working for said that they'd move him to, they needed somebody in Oklahoma and if he'd moved back, they'd give him a promotion and a raise, and he tried not to smile, and we got the heck out of it. <laughs> yeah, so we, we went back to Norman, and uh, then I didn't work for years, years and years and years and years and years. In fact, all my friends didn't even know I was a nurse. And then one day I was looking at the papers, and they had a part-time part -time job for a new, newborn nursery nurse, and I thought, Hmm. That would be good. That that way I could get paid for playing with babies instead of having them, and then they grow up. So I took it, and I did that, and that moved into. I started working more and more as the kids got gone, and then I became their educate their educator hmm. for all the maternal child area, and then for the whole hospital, and then I got asked by the university. Of Oklahoma to come help run this program in that brand, that did continuing education oh. in maternal child for all professionals that touched a mother or baby in every hospital in Oklahoma and I did that and then when I when I retired I had a there was one piece missing of this program and nobody would was going to do anything about it, so one of my coworkers and I, we wrote it. It was on breastfeeding, and we formed our own company, and we did that for 15, 16, 20 years, something like that, and did it all over the United States, and we sold it last about six months ago. So now I don't have anything. But that's how I do but I never had any vomit. <laughs> <laughs> You you mentioned a daughter Molly, right? But then you have a son also, Mitchell. 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 Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought, but I didn't want to. Yeah. The, uh, the the children do they live in Oklahoma also? No, Molly lives in Ohio. Mitchell lives in Phoenix. Phoenix. Okay. So you've got a reason then to visit other yes. parts of the country yes. now. Yeah, we, we travel around. Mitch lived for a long time in New York. Molly's lived pretty much in Ohio, Indiana. They didn't travel much. They, yeah, they were in Tulsa for a while. That was perfect. We loved it when they were in Tulsa. The first, they've got four kids, and the, the first, all but one of them were born in Oklahoma. 
neither one of them have followed anything to do with the medical profession, then, have they? Well, Molly has sort of. She she's she that she lives in the town called Terrace Park, which is a suburb of Cincinnati, okay. and it's a it's a real unique town. It's 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 just unique. It's it's like. Well, when she was telling us about this town, when they were moving there, we thought it sounded like the Stepford Wives, but it really isn't. It's, it's for real. But one of the things they have are, are volunteer firemen and volunteer EMTs. So she decided with these four kids that she's got, that have used the, one of them especially has used the EMT people a lot because he keeps riding his bike too fast. And <laughs> so, uh, but she decided she wanted to be an EMT so she could volunteer. So she, <laughs> that's her job. And she loves it. And we were just all blown away because she was the last person you ever thought would go into anything like that. But she, she just eats it up. She had to do these before you could get everything or, you know, get, get your license or whatever you had to do so and when you finished the course you had to do so many runs well Terrace Park's a little town that they don't have very many runs so they sent her someplace else and it was one of these places in Ohio that's got a real opioid problem so they have they have a lot of they said this will be good because they have a lot of calls so so she went and she called me right after she got done and she says, oh, mother, this was the best day of my life. She says, it was just so wonderful. She says, I went and I, 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 I saved like two or three lives and, and, and which, which is, you know, and she says, I went in these houses that were full of bed bugs and, and <laughs> she started all this stuff and I'm thinking, oh my God, Molly, <laughs> that's just not you, that's not you. But she was, I mean, she was, she was just, Excited she just couldn't it. wait to go back and do it again. So, so that's the closest we've got. So it sounds like you've really retired perhaps in kind of twice. Yeah, I'm, I'll find something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> what, you say it was last year that you actually retired from your from the company? Yeah, yeah, we sold it. In, well, we actually sold it in September. So it's been, what, three, four months. What, uh, what was the name of the company? Rising Star Education. Rising Star Education. Hmm. Was, uh, and did it do a lot with using of computers to uh, educate with, or? No, we, it's actually a self-contained book. Oh. And with all the things you need for education. I did go back as part of, with my job that I did at OU, not, not with Rising Star, but I did go back and get a master's degree in uh, education for healthcare providers kind of thing. So I've got a master's degree and I'm an from, MED. From where? Central State University. In, in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. Okay. That's the that's like the old the original teachers college. But they got a really good program and they they did it at night so I could do it and work and all that stuff. So it was it was a good thing to do. And Keith is retired also, right? What year did he retire from? He retired in 60, I think 60, I don't mean 60, I mean 19. <laughs> I think it would be 2000 something. Yeah, it? it's, well, I think he did, I'm trying to think. I retired in the first time in 2000 and two, no, 2006. I think he retired in 2002. So it sounds like you've got a lot of nice, interesting things that you can do and family to visit. If you look back, is there some individual or person who's really influenced you, do you think, in your life? And oh, probably my parents. Okay. Be logical. There, there are a couple of good role models. Sure. I thought a lot of your dad, we belong to, I belong to Rotary, and so many times sat right across the table from him at breakfast. He always had... He always had a story to tell. Yeah, he was full of stories. <laughs> is there a, uh, an influence of your life that has been made by some event in the world, civic event, public event, crisis somewhere, that has maybe really made an impact on you? I 
I don't think so. I think it's, I think the thing that makes the biggest impact on me is, is that people need to be treated with respect. And I think I got that from my parents. And whenever that goes away, it, it bothers me. I mean, I really do think that we need, we, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other. Your parents obviously were in a different, I guess, attitude of people and especially authority and all. Then we come down several generations. Do you think that respect and just what you're talking about, attitude towards other people has changed a lot in the last 15, 20 years? Oh, yeah. Hasn't gotten better, has it? Mm -mm. It's terrible. I mean, it's really, it's really scary. It's good. I mean, I just see this whole, everything from the environment on, on just going to hell in a hot, you know, hell in a handbasket, as my mother used to say, or <laughs> my dad, or both of them. Daddy had a lot of sayings, too. But I guess we can get involved to a certain extent, but there's, I guess that feeling, what, what's gonna change it, or what can we do? Well, I think you have to start with the kids. Oh, yeah, I do too. And so many of them don't have two parents at home. They don't have parents. They don't. The, what happened was, I think, is when we started, we started celebrating children because they're children and not. used to when a child was born it had parents and if there were parents that weren't that you know if they had to get married so be it you know <laughs> but and and sometimes those didn't work out but at least there was somebody there that stepped up and said here is a child this child needs care and and we've got you know we've got to we've got to fulfill that duty one way or the other and now they're just, when I was working at OU, I had an office that was next to the ultrasound room in the OB department for a while, had this office. And I could sit in that office and they would bring these girls in from, that were at the penitentiary and pregnant in shackles. They brought so many of them in that I could tell the difference between whether they were taken off the arm, the, arm, the hand ones or the feet, foot ones. And okay. it was, but then they'd come out and they'd go, oh, it's, it's dude, blah, blah, blah. Now I know who the daddy is. And I thought, that's, you know, that's where we've gone wrong. I think it was, and it was a school, I think in Indiana, I don't know if it was a Terre Haute school or not, that 80% of the children there were on lunch program, or I mean, a yeah. uh, funded program. They weren't able to afford lunches. I think that's shocking. That is shocking. Well, Norman, which is a high, one of the highest scale kind of communities in, Norm in Oklahoma, when I was, back in all those years where I was doing no pay stuff, I was very up to my neck in the, in the nonprofit boards. You know, I was on a lot of boards that dealt with children and stuff like that. And we would try to get different grants. And we didn't have enough people on the, the free and reduced lunch to qualify. Well, now we can qualify for every one of them. And it's the same town. I mean, it's, yeah. But it seemed like the whole welfare system, it keeps growing because Grandpa didn't work. Dad didn't work. Why should I? I mean, it just well, and they don't. They don't understand. Becomes a way of life. They don't understand it. I think one of the thing, the other thing that's really killed it, is child labor. They went overboard on no, we don't want kids working in sweatshops. But you know, there's no reason that it, that a 12 year old can't mow yards for a living. 
There's no reason. And people, people in this, when I say that to a lot of people in this part of the country, they don't understand that because they're all farmers. And farmers' kids can work on the farm. You can work in your dad's, but when you get out in the rest of the world where daddy goes off to this office and mother goes off to this office, there's nothing for these kids to do. Many times there is, but they don't want to find it either. Well, but no, but you can't work till you're 16. You can't draw a paycheck. Not a paycheck, but yeah. I mean, they can, they can yeah, do... Yeah, they, they can do chores can and do stuff like that, but yeah. there's no, there's no, there are kids that want jobs. When kids get to be about 12 or 13 years old, they're begging for a job where they can get a little bit of money. And they'll do it, and they're eager to work. And, you know, by the time they're 16 and they're allowed to work, they've formed all kinds of bad habits, and they're not interested, it's exactly. And I think that's a real I problem. Do. Gee, it's been such a fun time talking <laughs> to you, Linda. Uh, and I know we've all got so many electronics and things all around us. But is there a modern convenience that you'd just say, I couldn't live without? I couldn't live without. I don't know. <laughs> I could live without the, without the computer, I can tell you that. I could uh, too. <laughs> uh, probably the phone. I, I think you need, I think you, in this, in this society now, you really need to be able to get a hold of people. Yeah. But everyone's going down the street with her. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean doing that, but just a way to get. Yeah. If you were, and I know you've traveled, but uh, let's just say you're in France or England or somewhere, and you say, someone says, hey, where are you from? And you say, well, I'm from North, Northern Oklahoma, but I originally started out in a place called Marshall, Illinois. What? What would you tell them about Marshall and why it might be an interesting place for them to visit even? Well, I tell people that all the time. I tell people it's a... It's a lovely little peaceful town. Good description. And that, that you can come here and, you know, because, well, I mean, I've got, I've been coming back to Marshall forever. I mean, I've got friends who drive down I-70 and see the sign and come in and drive around and call me up and say, we went to Marshall, we've heard about it all our lives, we had to go see it. <laughs> so. And this is maybe a question you don't even want to answer, but have you and Keith ever thought about moving back to Marshall? Oh, yeah. We play with that a lot. The, the, <laughs> the kids and uh, the grandkids in Ohio make a nice draw. A little closer. Yeah. So, well, I don't really and that house know. out on the hill is, you know, it's nice out there. So, well, it's been, as I say, a real great experience visiting well, with you, you and I appreciate your time. Anything else you want to add about your family or your, especially your dad? Because uh, people, was, I guess, consider in the community he was a real fixture and a big influence on what's taking yeah. place in Marshall. I'll look at my little list here. I think we about covered it all. I will tell you a story that you'll appreciate though. My mother really, really, like I say, she had a hard, hard growing up. She was one of eight, no money, you know, just really hard, hard life. But she loved squirrel and she loved brains, which none of, nobody else in the house was at all interested in. But we used to, when we were having these dinners, we sat in the dining room in that house and mother sat here, here's the kitchen. Mother sat here, here's the front door. Daddy sat here. And Mary Kay and I sat right here looking at the front door. And one night, one lovely, probably late summer, early fall night, when it was still light outside, really late, we're all sitting at the table, and the door, the screen door is closed, but the main door is open. And Mary Kay and I are looking, and up the steps comes this man with a big string of squirrel. And he's standing there like this. You knew who it was? It was Father Donahue in his full regalia. I mean, he had the whole thing on and these dead squirrels. He was a big hunter. And my mother thought he'd brought the Holy Grail to her. She <laughs> was it. so excited. And, <clears throat> 
and I'll ne and I'll never forget it. I mean, every time I sit at a table and look at a screen door, I think, okay, Father Donahue, where are you? Oh, you know, yeah, he was a big, big hunter. Yeah. Loved, to, loved to hunt. Well, your mother must have had some feasts then for quite some time. Yeah, huh? she enjoyed it thoroughly. We, Let me just add, did you have a freezer or something that you could keep them in that time? I, I think by that time we did. Probably wasn't very big, but we had. But, but it was, I mean, I if he'd been up there in hunting clothes, it wouldn't have had half the effect, but he'd gotten dressed up, and there he was, and I thought, okay. <laughs> he and my uncle Russell, which is my dad's brother, and you probably probably even knew his family, um, they, they went on hunting expeditions every once in a while. Yeah. Well, thank you so we much, Linda. Welcome. I want to say I really do appreciate your taking the time out when you're in Marshall, and probably had a lot of things you were wanting to do here. But we appreciate your pictures. And as I said earlier, this is not for necessarily next week or next year, but sometime. somewhere someone's going to say, gee, I didn't know that about Linda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's probably a lot you don't know about Linda. <laughs> Thanks again. Well, thank you for doing this. You've got your Christmas pen there, I see. Um, pen. As I said earlier, I, I really always thought so much of your, uh, of your dad. We used to have uh, a lot of conversations.